16 and 17. Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Bible says it's a sign that you follow me. And tonight we want to talk about a day for liberation. Before we do that, you know what we always do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how grateful we are that we have come together tonight with the power of the Word of God to study, to enjoy, to uplift us. And we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will be our guide. We pray that the presence of Jesus will inspire us. And we pray that we shall leave feeling better than when we came because we have heard from God Almighty. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me tell you one of the reasons why I'm feeling pretty good tonight. Uh, for those who've been studying with us over the past few nights, you recognize that there is a special blessing on a certain day. Anybody remember? That day starts at a funny time for some folk. Uh, your insurance policy, your automobile insurance, cancels at 12.01 a.m. while you are asleep. Remember that? Then you wake up the next day and you say, I got one more day. The fact is that it got you while you were asleep. Well, they have reckoned the day at the wrong time. Start in Genesis. Start at the very beginning of the Bible and you will find it say, the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning, second, third. When God reckons the beginning of a day, he starts at sunset. So just over an hour ago in the United States Eastern time, we began the holy time that we call the Sabbath. And I don't know whether you feel it yet, but I do. I feel blessed already. Is there anybody else who feels that? Well, <laughs> you certainly ought to. Tonight I'm going to show you from the Word of God what I think is one of the most amazing phenomena that I have ever seen. The fact is, I'm about to do what the historians call revisionism. They use that term in a terrible way. They say that somebody went back and changed history. I have discovered that if you don't know the real truth about history, and you find out the real truth about history, it will be revised in your mind in a legitimate way. And tonight, I want to show you that if we look back at the history of Israel and at one of the most dramatic moments in the Bible, at least for me, I I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to try not to talk too much about it. But when I think about God opening a dry path through the Red Sea, I get excited because nobody else could have done it. I want to show you tonight that the most powerful moment in that whole scenario came about because of God's Sabbath. And I'll show it to you. I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm going to read from the uh, New International Version only because it's a little bit clearer. You will see it in the King James. But in the New International, it's just a little easier to see. Exodus chapter 5, starting with verse 17. Exodus chapter 5, starting with verse 17. This is surprising the way it's phrased in the NIV. It's almost as striking in the King James, but this language is updated just a little bit. And in this instance, the NIV gets it just right. And here's what it says. Exodus chapter 5, starting with verse 17, going through verse 19. Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are. Lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw. 
yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foremen realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you each day. Now let's get real for a minute. Pharaoh says, these people want to go out in the wilderness, but I can't imagine what they want to do. In fact, he declares right here, I know what it is. They don't want to work. They want to take a day off. They have worked six days, but they don't want to work the seventh day. Now, you and I understand that perfectly after our study last week, don't we? The, the commandments declare, six days shalt thou labor. I hope I made somebody go to work by reading that last week. I hope somebody was faithful for six days. The Bible says six days you should labor. And then on the seventh day you should rest. Pharaoh evidently is either feigning that he doesn't understand or he's trying to put something over on God's children. He says it's not because of any religious reason. You are just lazy and here's what I want you to do. I want the taskmasters to take away the straw that they used to provide. In other words, not only must you do everything that I told you to do before, but we will take away your straw and we will make you keep up with the same numbers. I will penalize you for keeping a day holy. I will penalize you because I think you're lazy. So it's obvious here that Pharaoh is not about to cooperate with what God commands. Now, I'm going to say this uh, carefully, but if there's ever a moment in your life when what a man says conflicts with what God says, take my advice. Do what God says. Because God can back up what he said. Uh, I, you know, there are times when, when God's mercy is misunderstood. Just because uh, when you read in the Bible, there were people who did things. Uh, there was a man named Uzzah who touched a wagon that had the Ark of the Covenant on it. And the Bible says he dropped dead. And there are people who say, well, see, he did those things back there. But he's not the same now. Well, I agree that he approaches us differently but just because people are not dropping dead immediately from disobeying God, that does not mean that God has lost his power. He has not lost his power to command or his power to make it so. He has given us mercy to allow us to decide to obey him. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that. Do you know that God could cause us to be good hmm? you could wake up in the morning fold up in your bed and go about the whole day doing only good things people would ask you what's come over you I don't know God could cause you to do right but God is not about turning people into puppets God doesn't want you to obey him because you have to he wants you to obey him because you love him he wants a response from your heart and I thank him for that because that draws us together well let, let's talk about what happened Exodus chapter 7 and verse 16 from the NIV this is God telling Moses what to do then say to him the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. But until now, you have not listened. Now, when God tells you to say that kind of thing, say it. Now, if God didn't tell you, maybe you ought to make it politically correct. Maybe you ought to soften it a little bit. But if God commands Moses, as he did, you go tell Pharaoh that I told you to let my people go so that they may worship me. Remember that this is changing history for most of us because we never thought about it happening this way. 
The fact is that it had to do with the people of God keeping God's commandments. And in the heart of those commandments, the fourth commandment, God says there's one day that is holy. There's one day that I rested on. I blessed it. I, I sanctified it. I called it by name and not by number. It is a special day for us to commune together. And if you take your foot off of it, I will let you ride on the high places of the earth. I'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob. I will bless you if you keep my Sabbath holy. And the people of God, even in slavery, recognize that you must obey God over man. So while Pharaoh had the power to command them as slaves, God had ultimate power. And so they chose to worship God and they ask please let us have one day we'll work hard six days that's what God told us to do but on one day we want to go and worship God and until now Moses says you haven't done it so what did God do God sent plagues these plagues are described in the word but uh, let me talk about the last one it was a plague where if you did not have the blood sprinkled on the doorpost of your house, death would come through the land. Now, there's a powerful message in there. In fact, could I please make this my half experience the power moment? Because I got a bigger one. God said, sprinkle, sprinkle the blood of a lamb. And you must know that every one of those symbols had power for it is not the blood of a lamb that is powerful it is the blood of Jesus that's powerful but they said every time when the death angel comes he will pass over the houses that have the blood sprinkled because that represents the blood of Jesus and God recognizes the blood of his only begotten son so those who sprinkled the blood had no problem but in Pharaoh's house, where no blood was sprinkled, you know that the, the child of Pharaoh died. And Pharaoh said, get them out of here. And the people who served God faithfully were delivered by his outstretched hand. In fact, let me read it from, from Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15. And you'll be careful, I hope, to listen to why God said he did it. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. God said to Pharaoh, let me tell you why I want them to go, because they're going to worship me. Pharaoh responded by saying, tell them they're lazy and I'll make them keep the same number of bricks and get their own straw. But after God spoke to him in action, after God delivered them by power, Pharaoh said, let them go. And the people of God were set free by something that was invisible, but it was the hand of God, the outstretched arm of God. And the Bible says God took the people down to the Red Sea and Moses only had to lift up his rod. And God saw that it happened. And the waters went back and a dry path was made through that place well you gotta forgive me I got a, an amazing imagination I imagine that when those walls of water went up there must have been some living creatures in that water do you know what it must have been like to walk on a dry path through a deep body of water and look in the wall and see something moving and swimming inside of it if I had been a kid moving in there, I would have been so excited. I've been trying to tell my mom and trying to tell my dad, look, see those fish, look. Uh, stop talking about it, son, walk through. Yeah, but you don't see. Look what's in the wall. God had opened up a dry path, but on at least one side, the water was still there, and they marched through. And then the Bible says that when Pharaoh's army had come down with their chariots, God cut off their chariot wheel and stopped them and the enemies were drowned and God's people were set free let me tell you what the Bible intends for us to understand if you honor God in what he commands if you obey what he asks he has the power to set you free 
Do you see it? In fact, here is the first moment where you see the power to experience for yourself. You must know that, that whenever God asks something and you in faith obey him, he does not forget who you are. There was Israel locked in the bowels of another nation. There was this small nation in comparison, some would suggest. There they were with nobody to defend them. There they were made slaves in a foreign land. And everybody could have forgotten about them. But if you obey God, he remembers where you are. He knows your situation. And he will not let you suffer forever without his power to come and so God saw them and protected them and delivered them so that my suggestion to you tonight for your first moment of experiencing the power of the Lord is that if you obey him particularly with his Sabbath he has power to set you free now the question is do you need freedom many people think they are already free I suggest to you that most of us live out our lives in quiet desperation somebody telling you what to do when I was a child I used to say to my brother quietly so that my parents would not hear I can't wait until I'm grown <laughs> I was under the misapprehension that when you become grown nobody tells you what to do anymore I have learned since then that many people <laughs> tell you what to do. Um, there is a, a friend of mine from long ago who said there is a man who always tells you what to do. His last name is Moore. First name is Need. Need Moore will tell you what to do. It will make you get up in the morning when you don't want to. You will go to a job that you don't particularly like. You will do things that you don't particularly find interesting. But you got to do it to take care of your needs. I suggest to you that most of us live obeying somebody or something. But God says, you should see what I've already done for people who took the risk as slaves. These people had no power, but they did have the power to obey God. I don't care if somebody ties you and puts handcuffs on you. I don't care if they put leg irons on you and put you in a prison. I don't care where they put you or what they try to take away from you. You have the power to obey God Almighty. You have, you have the power to decide to do what God asks. And when you obey him, God does not forget you. So understand that one of the greatest moments of liberation in the Word of God or for that matter in any kinds of literature is the day when God set Israel free and we have just read from the Word of God that it was about the Sabbath the people of God wanted to keep the Sabbath Pharaoh said no God said yes Pharaoh said I'll keep you God said I'll set you free and when man's power comes against God's power man's power is in trouble you must never forget it so experience this moment the fact is that when you are deciding to take the blessing and let's let's be careful to notice this we already promised those blessings from keeping God's Sabbath but God says more than that I will honor you I will protect you I will provide you with freedom when you need it because you have chosen to obey my word now I, I can tell you that there are many theories out there that try to keep us away from understanding the blessings of God's Sabbath let me talk about a few of them I can't spend long on them because you know the best way to know truth is to study the original if you ever want to know what a counterfeit hundred dollar bill looks like you should not study counterfeits you should study the real thing the way to determine a counterfeit is not by discovering what counterfeits look like they'll only confuse you but if you have the real thing 
you'll always know what's a counterfeit. There are people who want to try and steal from you the blessing of God's Sabbath by putting some little suggestions in sideways. Let me give you one. Uh, that's the Jewish Sabbath. Have you ever heard that? I've got a couple things I want to say, and I don't want to say them with an attitude. I want to say them as humbly as I can. The first thing I want to say to you is that when God in Genesis said, I rested on the Sabbath, I blessed the Sabbath, I sanctified it, 2,000 years passed before there was a Jew. They are called Jews in the Bible, Hebrews now. But if you check history, secular history, you'll discover that 2,000 years passed before there would be anybody who would be called Jewish. So how in the world can you call it a Jewish Sabbath if God said it in Genesis? But even if that were so, even if it were called a Jewish Sabbath, if you look, well, I maybe I ought to turn to this one, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Even if it were so, and I'm sure somebody wants to say that it is. So let me give you my second level of discussion. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. And here's what the Bible says. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So whatever I read in the Bible that belonged to God's chosen people, the people who came as descendants of Abraham, the Bible says when I belong to Jesus, I become the seed of Abraham. And anything God promised to Abraham, I get. Is that our experience the power moment or not? Because in Christ, I become an inheritor, and everybody I know wants to get in on some inheritance. God has promised it to you, and I thank him for it. Now, you also need to be careful giving the blessing of the Sabbath to the Jewish nation, because in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it says that God created woman using a rib out of Adam and presented the woman to man. If you give the Sabbath to the Jewish nation, when the Bible says, well, let's read what the Bible says. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. You might not want to believe this one unless you see it. Genesis chapter 2, let's go with, with verse, verses 21 and 22. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs, and one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman, and brought her unto man. So God gave woman to man. Verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. God gave the woman to the man. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. The reason why I am very reluctant to give the Sabbath to any other nation is because here's what the Bible says. This is Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So if God gave woman to man and the Sabbath to man, if you give away the Sabbath, aren't you at risk of giving away woman? I didn't hear any deep-voiced amens out there. But I can tell you one thing, I'm not giving away the blessing of the Sabbath. And if anybody proposes that I give away my wife to some other nation of people, you will have a stringent argument out of me. God gave man the Sabbath. God gave man woman. And the fact is that he did not give it to a nation of people, but to anyone who would serve him and worship him and obey him. And I thank God. I thank God for the gift of his Sabbath. And there are people who say that the Sabbath was changed. I, I turn you to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and start with verse 18. 
Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse, verse 18 says, well, let me go to 17. Think not, Jesus is talking here, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So I'm saying to you, that the law was not changed because of anything Jesus did. In fact, some take it a step further. They say Jesus commanded that when he rose from the dead, that in order to celebrate his resurrection, you should meet on the first day of the week. I've got a couple of things I want to say, and they're going to make sense. The first thing you want to note is, that if you look in, in Romans, and I don't want to look all these up, but i got to read some of these things because you've got to see them. Romans chapter 6, and here's what it says in verse 4, beginning with verse 4. Well, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So the way you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus is by baptism. You go down into the water like a person who is dead. But just like Jesus came forth from the grave, you come forth to walk in newness of life, and every time you see a baptism, you are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's his suggestion. Not only is that the affirmative side, but you can't find anywhere between the covers of this book where Jesus said, when I, when I leave, change the rule. Let me tell you something he did write about. Uh, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I hate to sound like a lawyer here for a minute, but don't let anybody steal your blessing. <laughs> this thing is too good to let somebody steal it from you. This is John chapter 16. If, if Jesus had a plan to change the day of worship, wouldn't he have explained it before he died? I'll show you what he did explain. This is John chapter 16, and I'm going to start with verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Skip down to verse 26. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I shall not unto you, pardon me, and I shall say, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Here's what Jesus said before he died to clear up prayer. He took all of this time to clear up prayer. He said, until now, I prayed for you. But when I'm gone, ask the Father in my name, and he'll give it to you. You folk are kind of slow tonight. That feels like an experience the power moment to me. If you ask God anything in the name of Jesus, God will recognize the name of Jesus and answer your prayer. Without the name of Jesus, it's like having a bank card and no pin number. But when I come in the name of Jesus, I may ask, but until I punch in J-E-S-U-S, -S, nothing is promised to me. You got to have the promise and the pin number. Well, forgive me. I'll get excited by myself tonight. Now, I'll show you one more thing, and then I'll leave that because I got something else that's powerful before we leave here tonight. There are people who think that God did in fact, that Jesus did in fact, tell the disciples, when I come back to meet you after I am gone, 
That will change the day. In other words, they suggest that Jesus had made an appointment with the disciples, with his followers, and said, here's why it's changed. When I come back, I'm going to meet you on the first day, and that'll be different. Uh, Luke 24. You know something, this book is amazing, isn't it? Got a lot of answers in it. So if it be so that Jesus made an arrangement, said, I'll tell you what, worship on the seventh day, my holy Sabbath, worship on that day until I die. But then when I am dead and I return to you, it may be that I shall meet with you on the first day and that will be a different day. Perhaps some suggest Jesus made that arrangement. Well, let's see. Luke chapter 24, and start with verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. So if there was an arrangement to meet with the disciples and change the holiness of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day, I can't understand it because when the disciples saw him, they remembered no such arrangement they were frightened, they were startled, and said to each other, that must be a ghost. Do you see what I say? In fact, if you look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 14, Jesus said to them, why don't you believe? Friends of mine, all I'm asking you is this. Don't let this blessing slip through your fingers because somebody conjures up some strange kind of theory. The Sabbath was and is and ever shall be. It's in the middle of God's law. The law is holy and just and good. It will last forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be taken from it. That's why on every Sabbath, I am blessed because the promise of God does not go away if you believe it can I hear you say amen? amen well let me share with you something that I also believe is a miracle I believe first of all that the Sabbath is a blessing I I am blessed every time it comes I when the Sun sets a peace comes over me all of my uh, service people and we don't have many you know I guess if you have a lot of money you have a lot of service people but anyone who comes to collect for the people or collect for this or that, they know that if they don't get there by a certain time on Friday, that that guy goes into another mode. And I'm sure they've talked about it with each other. Look, you better get him. In fact, if I were you, I'd get him before noon. Because he gets really different. He acts real happy, but he won't pay you after his son says. In fact, I can tell you his speech. He'll tell you, I'll be glad to give it to you. In fact, I might even give you more than I owe you, but I won't do it now because this is a different time. I have now moved into a day that belongs to God. So, so don't bother him. He'll give you a long speech, but not one dime. <laughs> so, so when I ease into the Sabbath hours, it is such a wonderful moment. Uh, my mother my grandmother, and now I am happy to announce to you, my wife, learned this thing to do with, with food. Uh, kind of like that manna rule. You remember the manna rule? You get the same amount of manna every day except on the sixth day of the week when you get twice as much. And on the sixth day, it'll last until the seventh day. So you don't have to go out in the morning gathering manna because that's the day when you commune with Jesus. Well, kind of like the manna thing, my wife can put something together on Friday 
and put it in the refrigerator and the same God who blessed manna must still be alive in fact I'm sure that he is because when I sneak a little taste on Friday and I do that from time to time it's very good on Friday but when it's warmed on Sabbath something has happened to it and it's not my imagination it's the God of manna because what God preserves into the Sabbath is blessed by his almighty hand so we don't have that to worry about <laughs> in fact the blessing of the Sabbath is that you put aside everything you can put aside and ask the question about everything that you propose does it glorify God now is it a day for you to just stay at home and sit down ah boring but I'll tell you what there have been times when I've gone to a hospital with no member to visit and I'd say is there anybody in here who doesn't get visitors almost every time you do that you will find yourself in a room with someone with a case that is extraordinary I can't describe them because I don't have time but one of the most beautiful things to do on God's holy day is to go and take joy to someone in the name of Jesus someone someone who has no one I have been to nursing homes and I ask is there someone here who doesn't get a visitor and they always have someone there's somebody whose children or whose relatives don't come and I think that if Jesus were here now on a Sabbath you might find him at a nursing home you might find him by the bedside of someone who can't be healed you might find him at worship and I love to worship on God's holy day so there are things to do but let me tell you what is one of the most outstanding things about God's Sabbath and that is that it connects me to him in public have you got it I know what you want you want scripture Ezekiel chapter 20 you have learned that when you come here we bring it from the Word of God and that's a good thing isn't it Ezekiel chapter 20 what I want to say to you God gives us blessing through the Sabbath God gives us freedom through the Sabbath God claims us publicly through the Sabbath Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12 Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them now let me just deal with the end of that text before we go any further to sanctify is to make holy let's admit it you and I were born in sin shaped in iniquity in sin did our mothers conceive us in fact we are of our father the devil I wish that I could say we were born pure I was not my father used to tell a story on me I hated it when my children would hear but they loved it they would sit there with east to west smiles on their faces and say granddaddy tell us about daddy when he was a little boy and I try to tell him no, no man. I'm trying to straighten him out don't tell him anything I did wrong and he would love to tell it he said when your dad saw his little brother born he was angry well I can't remember it and I don't think I would have been that kind of person dad said one day we went into the room where your your uncle was in the bed that used to be your father's and your dad had watched him so long in his bed and watched him drinking from his bottles we didn't have the money to get new ones we recycled them and he said I would sit there and watch my little brother in my bed 
drinking from my bottle, and I assumed, I suppose, that it w must have been my milk. <laughs> he said, one day they came in the room and found me as much bigger as I was than my brother, lying right beside him, squeezing him in the bed with the bottle in my mouth. That's the selfish spirit that I was born with. But something happens when Jesus comes into your life. Jesus changes my spirit so that the selfishness is taken away by the love of Jesus Christ. So this first text that I read to you says this, you keep my Sabbath as a sign to show that I am the one who made you holy. Do you know nobody else can make you holy? A, a judge can declare you not guilty. A court, a jury can say you are not guilty, but they cannot call you holy. Only God can make people holy. And, and God says, when you keep my Sabbath, it is a sign between you and me that tells you I am the one who changed you. Now here's my question. Well, let me get the second sign, then I'll come back to you. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. Let me read it in the NIV. Well, I should have read that other one. That's amazing. It says in the NIV, Ezekiel 20, 12, also I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between us so they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. Look at Ezekiel 20, 20. I'm reading it now from the NIV. Keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. My question is, why would God want to be connected with me publicly? All right, let's get real. When you think about who you really are, I'm not talking about who most of the people think you are. Most of us have a decent front. Eh? Particularly among holy people. Oh, we are amazing. How are you? Praise God. Oh, it's just so good to see you. Ah, oh, it's wonderful to be with God's people. Now, you know, you don't say that on Tuesday probably, but you think that's the way to increase your image among people who are good people. And you want to be one of them, so you blend in. You listen to what they say. And then you add that to your vocabulary. You know. Oh, yes. How, how great, praise God. I am, I am blessed and highly favored. Do you, do you know what God knows about me? And I might as well add you in for good measure. God not only knows everything I have ever done wrong, God knows some things that I am planning now. Huh? I hope I made you swallow something when I said that. Because there are people who come to worship God with plans to do wrong. And I guess they think God doesn't know that. So you may be fooling everybody else, but in the back of your head, you, I can't wait until Saturday night I got something in my God not only knows what you are planning to do but God knows some things that you would do if you weren't afraid you can't get away with them you know there's some of us that say I would like to I would like to get him for what he did to me but somebody might catch me. <laughs> so you are not 
you are not being good because you are holy you're being good because you are afraid when I was young my father had this way of telling us things that would happen if you do this something will happen and I remember doing wonderful things because I would almost do wrong and then I would remember what he said and I tremble and oh, I better not do it God knows us intimately and here's my question and and I want you to just don't think about anybody else but you with God knowing everything he knows about you why would he ever let you connect yourself with him in public cuz some of you I know better than to be connected with you there are people whose parents know kind of stay back a little bit but God says I have given you my Sabbath as a sign so that everyone will know let, let look at it it says keep my Sabbath holy that they may be a sign between us then you will know that I am the Lord your God listen if well, let me use the name that everybody uses. If Bill Gates got in touch with me and said, you know, I've, I've seen you somewhere and, uh, you know, I'd like to maybe form some kind of, let's form some kind of relationship. I'd have to take the phone away and say, praise God. <laughs> yes, Mr. Gates. Look, let's, I know that you are not wealthy, so I'm not going to ask you to bring any money to this deal. You just bring the presence and force of your personality. Yes, uh, go on. And as a token of our relationship, I'm going to send to you a few blazers and I'm going to put on the pocket of the blazers the imprimatur of my company and I would like to ask you would you be so kind as to wear them so that everybody will know that you and I are connected. You know it would be hard for me not to wear that blazer. <laughs> do you know that I would wear it prominently? In fact, I might come up to you like some people do and, Hi, how are you? Because <laughs> I want you to ask, What is that? Well, I really shouldn't say. But if you insist, uh, this is the uh, this is the company seal for uh, my friend Bill Gates. Can you imagine the power of my blazer? People would follow me everywhere. They would want to be my friend because I had a relationship with Bill Gates. Jesus says the silver and the gold are mine. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. I can open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. In me you live and move and have your being. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to me. And I know that you are not perfect, but I love you so much that I want to give you a sign that will connect us forever. 
if you will keep my Sabbath. If you, let me tell you, what God is doing is claiming fallible, imperfect human flesh, claiming you, saying, I made you holy, I am your God, and if you are willing to claim me every week, I'll say to the world that I am your God.